Today we'll be having a look at the Cisco 7200 series router from 1996. There is a very good chance your internet or LAN traffic has flown through the 7200 series of routers over the years. Despite coming out in the mid to late 90s, Cisco didn't end support for them until 2017. Along the way, we'll learn about the modularity these things offer from the port adapters on the front to the network processing engines that slot in the back. We'll also attempt to get a T1 connection running between this unit and some of this other Cisco gear. I'm really excited to fire this thing up. Let's get into it. This is a Cisco 7200 series router, specifically a 7206 because of these six slots it has on the top that we'll have a look at. And the main thing it's got going for it is that it's awesome looking. It's got this like peak 80s high tech mixed with 90s industrial design just incredible. As you can tell, this is a modular router system from Cisco. At the top here, we've got what are called port adapters. Mine has six of them, hence the 7206 in the name. They made a four port and a two port version. This is where all the interconnectivity really would go. So on the top, I've got a T1 card, a 10 base T card, and a serial card. We'll pull all of these out individually. And then you would have what's called the input output controller. I've got a really early one here. You can see from the large DB25 serial console connector. This is how you would actually connect your local console up to the router and manage it. It stores all your router configuration on these PCM CIA cards like you'd find in a laptop. Mine is woefully jammed in there. So we'll need to open that up and have a look at what's going on there. But they look like this. All the ones I've seen are these ATA flashcard 48 megabyte deals. So you've got these port adapters up here for interfacing with the network or other routers or a telecommunications provider, the input output controller for actually interfacing with the device itself and controlling it. And then around back, mine has redundant power supplies, but I think they can run on one. And then down here, we've got the brains of the operation. This is the network processing engine card or NPE. They made several of these. I have the latest that can run in this original 7200 series router. And on that note, it's easy to confuse what I have on the bench here with the later, more common variant that came out in 1998. The Cisco 7200 series VXR. This VXR 7204, remember four port adapters, was generously donated recently by a viewer named Brooke. If you're watching, thank you so much. I'm really excited to get this thing going. And it's very timely because as we look at this original legacy style 7200, we can compare and contrast the differences that Cisco implemented. Right off the bat, we don't see a lot other than this one only has four ports and this one has six. All of the physical locking mechanisms are the same. The blanks are the same. A lot of these cards are just purely interchangeable between the two. This is just a more modern version of the input output controller. It's got the regular style RJ45 Cisco console cable. You know, these blue guys. A really nice feature of this newer style input output controller is it's got two 100 megabit NICs that you can leverage. Around back, pretty much the same story, except I've got an NPE 300. So a slightly better processing engine, definitely not top of the line, kind of mid-range. But this one theoretically will not work in the older legacy chassis. But back to our original 7200 that we're taking a look at. It's got this locking mechanism that you can lock the port adapters in. Let's start by pulling out this T1 card. Once they're unlocked, they pull out pretty easily. They're upside down, so to speak. So I find myself looking at them like this, right? I'm inspecting, and then I wanna put it back in that way, but the back plane actually wants them flipped over. And there's some nice rails that they slide onto. It's pretty hard to mess up. Right in there, you can see the rail that the metal card can slide on. This piece right here, fits into those rails. And here we have a multi-channel T1 PRI card. Very excited about this. So long story short, this lets you have a T1 connection between two devices. That could be the T1 internet coming from your service provider or hopefully in our case later, two routers talking to each other over T1. Let's quickly pull the blanks out. So you just unlock them and they're full blanking cards that theoretically you could screw something into. I think exact same sort of chassis, of course. So clearly if Cisco was stamping a bunch of these plates and then changing out the front cover. My blanks are all dated 2002. So perhaps that's when this unit was created, but these are interchangeable with that newer unit I was showing you. So who knows? T1 has a sort of legendary status in my mind. Cause I remember it was like the fastest internet I could imagine back when it, back when it was out. I mean, you obviously never had it at your house, but 
yeah, still fascinating to be playing with it down here in the basement. This four port 10 base T ethernet card is next. 10 megabit. Let's see if we can find some dates here. Looks like we've got a bunch of AMD chips, PC net, PCI2 chips, 94 date codes on those guys. And then of course, copyright 1996. If I had to guess, I'd say this is probably one of the original boards that came with this unit when the first person bought it. And then we've got a very interesting port adapter, a serial V35 board. So this is actually eight variable speed synchronous serial connections over one cable. So it would have had a big old chonkin breakout cable that went in there and broke out into eight devices. Pretty rare to see something like this these days, but back then you'd have these pretty fast serial connections, you know, between two routers, for example, and they could operate at, you know, T1 speeds or better, depending on the configuration and the cabling. Another very nicely laid out board. I think I'm seeing 2000 date codes on this one, but of course, 1996 copyright on the board. So this would have been one of the original cards, I think, that was available when the 2600 came out. And we have a serious problem right here. We won't be firing this one up right away. It's interesting, the eBay listing had this machine fired up, pictures of it fired up, and this board had its green LED indicator on. So this board probably turns on, but doesn't work. And there's the damage right there. Full disclosure, I actually already knew about that. I pulled all these out very briefly in a Patreon video a few weeks ago, right when I picked this up, I was too excited and I just needed to get in here and look at this stuff, but I haven't fired it up. So we'll be doing that together here live for the first time. And if you wanna see behind the scenes type stuff like that, or even basement remodel updates, you can go check me out on Patreon, really helps support the channel and it helps me buy stuff like this Cisco 7200 series router. Let's get this input output controller out of here. The bigger the cards, the harder it is to pull them out because the back plane has so many connectors, which I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> A trick I've learned is put your screwdriver in there like that and you can use it for leverage. Oh, there we go. Got to get you up here so you get the full experience. Pretty cool. These are the big back plane, mid plane. We'll get to that connectors. And so obviously with so many pins, it's hard to get these things out. Down in here, we've got the ROM mon, well, <laughs> ROM. Looks like V11.1. ROM mon is sort of like the bootstrapping firmware on these Cisco routers before you actually get into something like iOS, the operating system that runs on them. I'm seeing a 1997 date code. So a solid year after the 7200 series OG form factor like this came out. Got a little bit of memory here. And then in this cage is the flash card holder and it is like completely and utterly stuck. It's going to be tricky because these are pretty thin. Let me grab one. You can't really be yanking on these with pliers. They'll just break. I mean, I'm going to try, but let's have a look. Yeah, I can't really tell. I suspect it's just corroded in there. So what I'm going to do is nothing. <laughs> We're just going to leave it and we'll try to boot with this input output controller the way it is. Hopefully we find some interesting iOS configs on this thing already. But if this one gives us trouble, the beauty of modularity, <laughs> I've got another dual fast ethernet input output controller, the more modern style with the RJ45 console connector. And it came with two of these flash cards. So hopefully there's even more interesting stuff on here. This is an eBay guy, but I want to see if this one works. So we'll try with that one first. Look at the awesome orange Intel chips on this newer input output controller. So cool. Seeing 2000 copyright codes on this one, by the way, around back. I am fortunate enough to have redundant power supplies here. Just some thumb screws that I loosened with the screwdriver earlier. Really nice pull handle on them. These come out super nice and easy. Big old connector there. Always nice to have two of these on the solder equipment because they will fail eventually. Four output voltages, DC, presumably. 5.2, 3.5, 12.2, negative 12. And the five volt rail is at 30 amps, which is pretty impressive. Now let's have a look at our MPE 200, Network Processing Engine 200. The brains of the operation, this sort of dictates how capable the machine is overall in terms of throughput and everything it can do. Like I was saying, the 200 is the fastest one you can put in this chassis. And this thing has a ton of backplane connectors. So I'm, I'm pulling pretty hard right now. Oof. And yeah, 
be warned, it's very hard to get those out. And these MPE boards are fairly impressive in their own right. As you can see, this is of course why it's so hard to pull out all these mid-plane connectors. Speaking of the mid-plane, there it is way back in there that the board connects to the MPE. As I understand it, you can only go up to this MPE 200 in this older chassis. I of course bought a slightly better MPE before I knew that. I've got a spare 300, the same that's in that VXR. I obviously didn't have that when I bought this. And of course my original 200. The Cisco logo always gives things away. The older one on the bottom here with the red, then the more modern looking, I would say. I like both these logos though. I don't know if I could choose which one I like more. Back to our MPE 200 here. We've got an RS5000 MIPS processor running at 200 megahertz. I think that's where the 200 in MPE 200 comes from. And over here, we've got four DRAM SIMs. Basic configuration was 32 megabytes, expandable up to 128. We might have that here because this looks like a lot more than 32 megabytes. We'll find out when we fire this baby up. Speaking of firing this up, part of the motivation for this teardown was getting rid of a bunch of this dust that's in the chassis. And I was going to go further, but I don't think that's going to be easy. The whole thing is held together by what is either a very unfriendly bit or a rivet. So don't really want to deal with that while we have it this way. In case you didn't believe me, Cisco 7206 made in USA. What a time to be alive. 1996 was. So yeah, I'm just going to try to clean this crap out the best I can with Windex and paper towels, maybe blow it out with the air compressor. Sometimes I wonder when I'm doing this stuff, if it would have been better to just not to have disturbed that dust. Cisco liked putting this big swooping motion on modular components. This is a much newer 2821 router generously donated by a patron named Kevin. Kevin, thank you. If you're watching and it's got that same swooping motion at any rate, all the way back in 1996, they were doing that. Let's get everything back together here, except unfortunately our V35 serial card. I'm going to leave that out because of that blown capacitor. We're looking good. You can see I left two slots blank. Let's talk about modularity. Other than of course, how badass this thing looks. Another excellent aspect is the modularity. This is a fast ethernet card, hundred megabit. Picked this one up on eBay right after I bought the 7206. This thing has both an RJ45 connector and this funny one over here, an MII media independent interface, basically an obsolete fast ethernet interface. And as a refresher, when a hundred megabit ethernet came out, they named it fast ethernet. It was obviously 10 times faster in order of magnitude faster than 10 bit. And I guess at the time they thought, yeah, not going to get much faster than this. I remember thinking it was fast. I'm assuming you can only use one of these at a time because they're both labeled interface zero right here, but I'm not sure. Uh, so we've got an led indicator for the RJ 45, something called link, maybe it doing something, you know, line activity. And then MII right here. I should have also noted earlier, each of these adapter port boards has a, what I think is a green led labeled enabled when it's turned on presumably. So we'll get that slotted right by our four port 10 bit T right there. I think there's some requirements and limitations about what and where you're putting in these things. But my uh, gut instinct is that anything I'm doing here is going to be just fine for that MPE 200 in the back. And while I'm doing this, I'm noticing uh, design flaws and or damage. The top T1 card here, its handle is pretty bent down because I think it's pretty easy to put this thing on its face and the cards on the top are going to take the brunt of that. And that's obviously what's happened here. I don't think there's damage to the card, but you can definitely see that is not a 90 degree angle there. And that's a mess. Hmm. That's better. Now what can happen is you start pulling down on this and this faceplate will get pulled back past its connectors and get caught. Let me show you. That's exactly what's happened with this 10 base T card. The edge here is covering the port. It's supposed to push freely through. And you can see we've got some wonky angles going on there. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, avoid my warranty here and take the board off briefly. And with it out, you can tell pretty obvious 
The board is straight, it has no damage, but the little chassis it goes on clearly is bent that way. Back of the board, just because we're here, have these really nice sort of built-in standoffs. And uh, we might as well look at it because probably eight people in the last 20 years have seen the back of a 10 base T Cisco 2600 port adapter made in the USA. Wild close up of these industrial standoffs. And we get to see a Burmo incorporated 1998 sticker. The screw didn't quite want to go into this one. My tolerances are just a little off, but you can just put it on the front because those standoffs are made to withstand a moon landing. They're threaded on both sides. Don't want Cisco tell you what to do. Okay, got this thing's little tray all straightened up and it's much better. Before, the RJ45 connectors weren't sticking out past the faceplate and now they are. I hate to say it because you're not really going to be moving this thing around a lot, you know, but it's a little bit of a design flaw. It's, it's way too easy to put pressure on these, especially these top ones and just bend the crap out of them. That's looking a lot better. All my pull handles are straight. The RJ45 connectors are sticking out of the face plates like they should. One slot left. Now to introduce the ultimate port adapter. Token ring networking. Most people are worried about, you know, how they're going to make a better life for their family or whatever. But I'm just worried about how I'm going to get a token ring network running in my basement. And I think I found my answer. This is yet another reason why I bought the 7200 series. Token Ring, of course, was a physical layer protocol that competed with Ethernet, Ethernet 1, of course. But in the mid 90s and maybe even as late as 2000, it was somewhat relevant. Some corporations had taken it on. IBM was the inventor, hence a very large IBM chip for every Token Ring port we have on this device. This particular board has some uh, interesting voltage regulator bodging going on with some Kapton tape to protect all the other components. It's really weird because the solder joints look factory, but <laughs> nothing else about this does. For whatever reason, token ring networks have always fascinated me. I've been slowly collecting some token ring paraphernalia to get a network going down here, but I didn't have a router. So I think this is going to be the key to actually making progress on this dream here. I have memories of being a kid and my dad had some IBM PS2s and they had those big chonky token ring connectors with the hubs and stuff. I never got it to work, but I remember messing around with it when I was really young. And for some reason, that's just like stuck with me. It's been one of my like core memories of computing. <laughs> and so I'm very excited to have this very flexible router that can do token ring. But back to reality, token ring stuff will be showing up on the channel in the future as we build that out. But right now we're in the T1 era. We'll leave it in there because I think it looks good though. She's all back together. Never fired it up. This is one of the most intimidating routers <laughs> I've ever experienced. I'm excited to fire it up, learn a little bit more about it. Let's get it hooked up. Got one of the power supplies plugged into this box here. Then we'll use one of these DB25 to DB9 serial converters. This larger serial port will be a throwback for some folks. Get that plugged into the computer with a serial to USB converter. And here we go. I have never turned this thing on. Fans are coming up. See some lights on the input output controller and we can see stuff on the console. This is good. Looks like we've got 11.1 ROM on just like we thought a 1997 version. Lights starting to come on. I think it might be decompressing iOS now. It is in fact looping and not getting anywhere. It tries to decompress some image, green lights come on, and then it restarts. Let me do some research. If I issue a break when it's trying to boot up, I can actually get to the ROM on prompt, which is good. Let's look at mem info just for fun. We're maxed out, 128 megs. Let's see what devices it can find. The slot. LEDs don't light up even though I have a flash memory in there, which is suspect. I can issue CPU card type and it knows it has an MPE 200. So the input output controller can talk to the MPE. That's good. So I haven't done anything other than poke around and I issued a CONT cont, which I think just tells it to continue trying to boot from whatever image it can find. It's possible the flash card has been wiped and yeah, I don't think it's finding anything. The stuck card was always pretty suspicious. I think I have to do exactly what I said I didn't want to. 
and uh, I don't think it's going to work without destroying this thing. <laughs> what could be grabbing it in there? I think I'm going to take the whole board out of its tray and then I can pry this shielding up. Cisco wasn't stingy with the screws on this one. It's out. And this, I don't think this is soldered in. Yeah, it's just pressed on there. The trick is just getting it out. Well, I was slightly afraid of that. <laughs> it won't even give me access to this bottom one. Man, that might be a Cisco branded one. You can barely see the logo. I was sort of hoping I'd be able to get a tool back in here to push it forward, but it does not look like it. For posterity, nice long bodge wire here from the factory. Another one right there on the front. Nicely taped down. I think I'm getting somewhere. So I've got these lineman pliers and I'm just pulling on the edge, not pushing the pliers down too much. The eject button is able to depress now. Ooh, look at that. So what was wrong with this thing? This is so cool. It is a Cisco Systems branded, really old one, a 16 megabyte one. It's got the Cisco sticker on it with the version of the software on there. So now the question is why wasn't this reading it? Way back in there, there was a piece of dust. I'll just have to show you as an example on the top one. There's a piece of dust wedged under some of the pins. And I think that's why it was so hard to pull out. Now, I don't think that was causing any actual interference, electronic interference. So that's suspicious. I got it. All this gunk was back in that connector. It's possible it was stopping it from seeding. I can't get over how cool this is. That's awesome. Let's put it back in. Yeah, it's just really tight. Ah, man, I think the pins are corroded back there. Came out easier, but I don't think we'll be using that slot. Let's see how bad. This one is, man, it's, <laughs> it's really, aha. Uh -huh. It's got these keyways. So you theoretically don't put it in backwards. And this one's all gummed up on that one. It had been jammed in upside down. So it's supposed to go this way <laughs> and someone had jammed it in like that. And then I just did that, you know, for round two, just for fun. So I'm going to try to help out this banged up connector. And then we'll try sliding it in the right way. Cleaned up that little groove. Check this out. I can actually eject it. This is still really stiff compared to my newer one, but let's see if the bottom works. Yeah, <laughs> much better. Let's get this reassembled and try again. This thing makes a really nice workbench. I have to get a spare just for that. Uh, thought it'd be cool to put this on last, but I took that board out to get this out in the first place. So I can't. And there we go. Put this together again. No less than 17 screws and posts to get this thing out of its tray. But check this out. And it even comes back out. So that's good. It was really nice to have some other cards to reference in terms of these slots and everything. These are from that newer input output controller board that we're going to put in here. Once we validate this one works, we are hooked back up. So this should just work. All right. That flashcard is suspicious. So we can ask for all the devices and it knows about slot zero and slot one. My card is in slot zero. So you should be able to say dir slot zero bad device name. So it doesn't think that the PC MCIA card is in there which isn't too surprising. The corresponding light isn't turning on. Let's pull the input Apple controller. Let's get this newer one in here. See what its story is. It uses the RJ45 console cable. Let's see what we get. We get a brief blink and then the unit doesn't turn on. This is going well. It doesn't like this one. Just a brief flicker fan spin once nothing. Pull this switch back to the old one. Some very brief research shows me that that newer board is not supported in this chassis. We'll just pretend that didn't happen. The older controller is still exhibiting the same behavior. I think the last time this ran was 2013. Kind of cool. Some of you were probably screaming at your screen. So dev device shows you what this thing knows about. It's got an ID and then a human readable name. My flashcard is in slot zero. So I'm over here saying dir slot zero, like a normal person. 
the colon is part of the device name. So you do dir slot zero, the device light blinks. What do you know? We have a bin that theoretically I should be able to boot with. So we're just gonna try to boot directly with this command saying in slot zero, boot this bin. I think that's what it was already trying to do, but we'll see. That's a good sign. Yeah, it was not trying to boot off that bin for sure. We have a router. What do we got? Uh oh. Doesn't like its config. It found that new fast ethernet 2.0. Then it started over. And we're back in the bootstrap. So it has a previous config that is really unhappy about when I try to boot. It's possible that flashcard is from a totally different machine. And uh, I'm just going to have to wipe it anyway. Well, it'll boot and it sees all the interfaces, but I think what happened here is the interface names are different from what the configuration expects. So it's, it's complaining about the configuration and then just boot loops this uh, Ramon thing. Hmm. We're going to change the boot settings and set it to ignore system config info. Maybe that'll work. Then we're going to reset. Our changes were persisted. Now we're going to boot off of slot zero. You can just do this, I learned. It'll automatically look for a file it's able to boot from. Okay. It did ignore the configuration. Not going to do anything. And then it just reboots. After it runs this decompressed image, the lights on all the modules start up. Then they go off and it starts over. So I think we got to start pulling modules. Now I can get iOS to boot and recognize all four modules, but then it crashes or something and gets into this boot loop, which smells a lot like hardware. What you just saw is I was booting from this flash card. There's also an older version in the boot ROM and it was the same, same behavior. It just crashes eventually and starts boot looping. It's also odd that I have to specifically tell it each time to boot on this. It won't do that by itself. So that's smelling like hardware or maybe some sort of incompatibility issue with one of these cards. So we'll pull them all out and then put them back in one by one. We're getting slightly different behavior. The enabled light on the controller is staying on, spitting out something about a Mac address, a random default being chosen. It booted on its own this time. It's still set to ignore configuration. So what I'm gonna do is, is reboot it and turn that off. I wanna see the old config. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of my adapter ports, port adapters. If I was betting man, Let's say it's that token ring card. But anyway, let's reload. This is a relief. That means the, the major components are working properly. <laughs> All right, back to ROM on. I'm going to turn off this ignore system config info. So now we're booting just as before, but with the original configuration. We should get a lot of complaints, but not a reset, I would think. Or I wiped the config somehow. That's also possible. Uh, well... Maybe I cleared the configuration somehow. We have a working router. Let's get some modules back in. While I suspect it is the token ring card for obvious reasons, my next suspicion is this T1 card. It behaved a little differently. The rest of them would show they're enabled. This one would flash enabled and its link lights. That just might be what the card does. And it's also possible I'm just putting these in a configuration that doesn't make sense. I think there are some rules to it, but I most want this T1 card to work. We're in the T1 era. So let's see. It does not like that card at the moment. Undefined port adapter in bay five. It says check card seating. Maybe I just didn't get it in there right. I wonder if it's that one. The lights turned on, I locked it and everything. I don't know if I just didn't notice this earlier. Check card seating. It's also possible one or more of the slots is messed up, I suppose. But yeah, that's suspicious. Let's let it do its thing. Again, more of you screaming at your screen. I think the bootloader just doesn't recognize it. If I say show diag, sure enough, slot five, T1 port adapter, two ports. So I think that one's fine. It's enabled light is on. I just don't know what I'm doing. I suppose we'll move forward in order of usefulness. Let's get this fast ethernet card in there. Also, like I was saying, I think this bootstrap thing just doesn't understand that T1 card. It's newer but the iOS version seems to be fine with it. I think we're okay. Fast ethernet interface. 
Sure enough, it knows about that port adapter. That's perfect. There is no electronic connection tied to that lock, by the way. I'm looking at it and it's open. Up next, 10 base T, four port card. Lock those two. Of course, the ethernet four port adapter, totally fine. Who would have thought this card would be the suspect? I didn't notice that in the eBay listing, by the way. I'm gonna put it in this top one. I was gonna put it here. This slot's kind of messed up. I don't think it's electronic. I think something mechanical really screeches when you pull those out. So let's throw it in here. It's the token ring card. Causes this hardware reset to take place over and over and over again. Uh, the green light turns on. My token ring networking dreams remain but a distant vision. It actually makes this card even more interesting. Someone came in here and tried to fix it and they kind of succeeded. iOS finds it, but then that hard reset boot looping behavior takes place. It makes you wonder what year this took place in. Like, like why was it so important to try to manually fix this four port token ring card? This looks like something I would do, but that's okay. We've got another one on the way. It'll be here next week. Well, this thing's functional and I promise we are very close to actually doing some routing with this thing, but I've been alluding to some sort of bandwidth requirements and rules related to these ports on the front and then the engine in the back. As it turns out, Cisco actually has a 7200 series port adapter hardware configuration guideline, which assigns bandwidth points depending on your NPE and your port adapters. And this guy must know a lot about Cisco because he's also in a T1 CSU DSU box and apparently an expert in Cisco regulatory compliance and safety information. So the basic idea here is you look at your MPE, I've got an MPE 200, and Cisco will tell you how many total bandwidth points that thing is worth. And then there are rules about how many points each port adapter and input output controller is taking up. And they've got every port adapter listed along with its bandwidth resource requirement and bandwidth points. You can also calculate how much processor memory is required. And then they give you this nice little bandwidth calculation table worksheet to write all your results down and figure out where you're at and if your configuration works. There's two, I think, PCI buses. We've got left and right. And ideally, you're distributing your points between the two of them, and the I.O. controller ends up in the left bus, as I understand it. So I've gone through and looked up all the points. This MPE 200 on the back gives us 800 bandwidth points to work with. Starting on the left channel, our two port T1 PRI is actually worth zero points. Our one port fast ethernet port is worth 200 bandwidth points. And our original input output controller here without ethernet, zero points. So in our left channel, 200 points total. On the right, we've just got that four port 10 bit ethernet card, 40 points. Of our 800 points available in this configuration, we're only using 240. So my hunch earlier was correct. The processor is more than capable of dealing with everything in here. Just for fun, if we were to pretend that our four port full duplex token ring card was working, it's worth 120 points. We'll throw that on the right channel. A total of 360 points, not even half of what this thing is capable of. You'll notice our one port fast ethernet card there is worth a ton of points relative to all the other stuff. And once you start getting to fast ethernet, a lot of points start getting racked up. This input output controller, the newer one with the two fast ethernet NICs, isn't compatible with this chassis, but this actually takes up 400 points just on its own. So if it was compatible, it'd be taking half our resources immediately just for these two fast ethernet ports. That's probably more than you ever wanted to know about that. Here's the plan. I've got this Cisco 2821 router. I think it's from 04, or at least it came out in 04 generously donated by Kevin on Patreon. Thank you. And it just so happens I have an HWIC T1 card that'll fit in the back of this thing. We'll get these guys talking over a T1 connection. Let's get this guy opened up real quick. We're already friends with this guy. We're going to need his help. I don't know anything about T1. Here it is. This guy is an HWIC high speed WAN interface card. And this monster here warrants its own video someday but it can slot right in there. I almost forgot. Got the old NMESW16. Let's get this baby in here. The most fascinating thing about networking equipment is all this modularity. Just incredible. The irony being, of course, this thing is probably now more capable and more powerful than 
this more impressive looking unit over here, but we'll get them talking over T1. Also, if you know anything about these units, you're probably like, what the hell are you doing? This is a fast ethernet module. And this thing up here is capable of gigabit. We're just, we're just messing around in the basement. I want to see if this thing works. Okay. So we've got the cloud retro world headquarters and the branch office over here. I have it under good authority that this thing works. I've never fired it up before. So we'll focus our attention here. The first thing we're going to need is a T1 patch cable. This guy is the gift that keeps on giving. It says a thousand feet, but I swear I've pulled 8 million feet out of this box. I think I said patch cable earlier. We need a crossover cable and I'll show you why a normal ethernet cable isn't going to cut it. We've got to make our own. My first piece of advice would be always pull out more than you think you need. My second would be get some cutters when you're doing this stuff. It makes it super easy. Oh, also these bulk boxes come with somewhere to put the end. Always do that too. Ask me how I know. While T1 can travel over an ethernet cable, it only uses four of the wires. And that's why you can't just plug any old ethernet cable in. Here's my low voltage wiring kit. So in here, I've got everything I need to wire up ethernet cables in any configuration I want. And I've got these loops with the sticky tape on the back to get them to run wires along a wall or something. And then these are really useful. You can get these at like Home Depot or whatever here in the States anyway. I think it's a coax sized piece of plastic, but works pretty good for ethernet cables as well. And then of course, if I could rename the channel, it would be Keystone Retro. Definitely use Keystone Jacks. They're modular and it'll work for T1 as well. In my kit here, I've got these pass through RJ45 connectors. These are the way to go. I'll show you why in a moment. And then we've got some boots to put on the wire. These are unnecessary, but make a nice professional finish when you're done with the wire. So everything I'm about to do applies to just doing normal ethernet cable as well, but it'll be way easier this time because it's less wires to line up. So I like to get a clean cut like this. So like, you know, get rid of extra angled crap like that. This is a Klein tool crimper, pass through crimper. And I'll explain what I mean by pass through in a second. And it lets you put your cable in like that and then kind of twist it around. And we can see that I can expose the inside wires. What I like to do is push all the pairs down like that. And then I cut the inner tubing off. We only care about orange and blue. So we can get rid of brown and green. I like to unwind everything on side one. We want our orange and white like that. And then we want solid blue and then white blue. You kind of do this swooping motion like this. Then you do it back the other direction and it really helps them line up. We've got more than we need and you can see it's getting all squirrely. So we'll cut it off. In this T1 application, we need one pin separating these two colors, which is kind of weird. I've never done T1 wiring before. And now we got to slide everything in white, orange, orange, blue, white, blue with a gap in between. And you can see I've committed the cardinal sin, which I do approximately 80% of the time. I forgot to put the boot on. So we're just not going to boot this one. And here is where it gets interesting. These pass through style connectors weren't around, you know, when I was doing this 20 years ago. And all you do is this, like how easy was that? If you're just down in your basement, hooking up T1 between two Cisco routers that have been out of service for 10 years, get one of these. Got the other side crimped up properly. So now we have a T1 crossover cable. Back over in iOS, we're going to issue the command show IP interface brief. And this is going to show us all the interfaces the router knows about and any IPs that happen to be assigned. And you'll notice it only knows about the ethernet interfaces. This can be a little confusing. If like me, you've only ever dealt with ethernet and you're wondering where's my T1 stuff. We can do a show run. And it knows about something called a T1 controller 5 slash 0 and a T1 controller 5 slash 1. Some WAN interfaces, such as T1, have an associated concept of a controller. The controller lets you configure the physical characteristics of how the transmission is going to take place over the line, and you need to do that first before you can assign an IP to it. And as a side note, you see this 5 slash 0, 5 slash 1. This simply means this is the T1 controller in port adapter slot 5, interface 0, 
or port adapter slot five interface one. So we do configure terminal and then I can configure this thing by name. We just need to configure a few things, the line code, framing and channel group and time slots. Now, if we take a look at our interfaces, we have a new one, serial five zero zero. It's configured, it's up because I have a cable plugged into it. Now we can give it an IP. Now, like you might configure an ethernet interface, we can get in there. We'll give this one an IP of 10.0.0.1. No shut. And now if we take a look at our interface IP configuration, serial five, 10.0.0.1. This router is set up, theoretically. I think we're ready to fire up the 2821. Got a console connection. Got our T1 line going to that HWIC we installed earlier. Imagine you're upgrading your Cisco rack and Cisco pulls a fast one on you. Moves all the ports to the back and the power to the front. Anyway, let's fire this up for the first time. Looking good. It has variable speed fans. It was pretty revved up and then once it got to here, it calmed them down. That's pretty cool. Looks like we've got iOS 12.3 a 2004 version. I think this thing was completely wiped before it was given to me, as all of these should be. It found that fast ethernet module. I'm not convinced it sees our T1 card. I don't think so. Yeah, it doesn't see it. Not a lot going on with the LEDs either. And I don't see anything in the documentation says it needs to be in a special spot or that it's incompatible or anything. I can't find anything that says it should matter, but We'll take it from slot zero to slot three, just to see if that makes any difference. I guess to remove another variable, I won't plug the cable in this time. Also unclear how that would affect anything. Yeah, it still doesn't see it. No signs of life on the back. Not sure, maybe that card's bad. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't see it. Okay, it does see it. The show diag, it sees it in slot three, the one I just put it in, unknown WAN, daughter card. So the version of iOS running on this from 2004 probably just doesn't understand what that thing is. I think it had 2007 date codes on it. Knows it's an HWIC 1DSU T1, but that's probably just generic. They're probably always able to read the product ID even of a card it doesn't understand. Well, that's okay. Well, I can look into upgrading iOS on this in the future, but for now, I think I'm going to go with plan B. This is a 2610 router and it's got a couple of T1 wicks on the back. Let's get this baby fired up. I suppose the 2600 series is more contemporary with the 7206 anyway. On this one, they're already somewhat configured. I think I'm plugged into serial 00, so I'll try to give that an IP. We're going to give it an IP of 10.0.0.2. The IP is assigned to the interface just fine, but I was trying to figure out what the T1 controller configuration was to match what we did on the other router. And I think I've wrapped my head around it. It's a little bit different in this 2600 version. You use this service module command so I can show the configuration for serial 00, which is the one I'm plugged into. And we can see it's complaining. Receiver has loss of signal, loss of frame. We'll figure that out. But framing is the same. The line code is the same. We have the 24 time slots. I think everything is the same, which is good. But I was talking with Mark over at the serial port. Those guys are T1 experts. And when you're doing this crossover situation with T1, one clock source needs to be line and the other clock source needs to be internal. I think both of mine are set to line right now. Back at the 7200, I can take a look at my T1 configuration here. ESF, line code's the same, just like we set earlier. But here it's confirmed, our clock source is line. We'll leave this one as line. Back on the 2600, instead of using that controller mechanism, you go to the actual interface and you can use this service module command. So I can configure the T1 settings inside the interface with service module. And so I can set clock source internal. Do you see a problem here? I made this end completely wrong. I was pouring over the configs trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. And I'm not saying we're out of the woods yet, but we weren't going to get anywhere with an invalid patch cable. Woohoo. Oh man, I haven't looked at the serial console yet. But we've got a green light here and we've got a green link light here. I think it's only right if we start on the 7200. Its IP is 10.0.0.1. The 2600 is 10.0.0.2. 
both links say that they are up. Let's ping 10.0.0.2. <laughs> it's working. We have a T1 network down here just because here's the 2600 pinging the bigger router. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, the sky's the limit now. We can start exploring bonding multiple T1 lines together. The single line is operating at a blistering 1.5 megabits per second at the moment. And then we'll get this VXR unit in the mix. I've got eight port T1 cards on the way for each of these. And this guy will get his own dedicated video, of course. And we can look into getting this 2821 into the right configuration so I can use this HWIC more T1 goodness. I am glad that this fast Ethernet port thing works though. This original 7206 was an absolute pleasure to learn about and use. Really fun machine to mess around with. And now that I'm a little more familiar and I know I can get T1 working with a variety of this equipment, I've got a lot of ideas about computers to hook up and networks to create. And of course, when we get tired of T1, we've got token ring, we've got ATM, other serial interfaces, tons of modularity and interesting things to explore with these two units. Speaking of, this VXR definitely deserves its own video. A huge thanks to Brooke for sending this my way and of course Kevin for the 2821 here. And it was fun to put this 2610 to work. I'd never actually used it in any real capacity before. I hope you enjoyed this adventure or misadventure and me stumbling along and figuring out iOS yet again. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. I've got more networking content on the way along with plenty of upcoming 2000s enterprise computing content. Thanks again for watching. Hope I see you in the next one.